everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here with Kevin Breckbill. We're in Chambersburg or near Chambersburg. Um, you're part of Chambersburg Christian Fellowship up here. Um, so a bit of an interesting topic today we're going to dive into. In, in America today, uh, it seems like you know, things are really polarized. And how can we as Anabaptists, you know, we believe in the two kingdom concept, what is our level of responsibility as kingdom Christians in a time like this? Where do we even start to try to untangle this mess? A, a very good question. Uh, what I find interesting, so I, gr I grew up Anabaptist and um, River Brother to be, to be exact. Most people uh -oh. probably don't, but don't, aren't aware of that. Uh -huh. And so my passion is to see the Anabaptists respond right to the kingdom of God. And when you, asked, when you sent me this question, one of the things that came to my mind is we need to understand our mission about kingdom mm -hmm. Christians. Um, what is that mission to reach out into a polarized culture, a polarized world? Um, what is that mission? And I think at the Reno, we hear this word a lot about two kingdom concept and what does that mean? What does that look like? What happens so many times is the distractions that we, we face as Anabaptists or we allow ourselves to be engaged in, um, distracting from that mission. And, you know, it's, it's, it's com complex on one side and yet I think it's very simplistic and powerful on the other side. And the simplistic approach that Jesus called us to, and, and what makes it political, if you will, his kingdom, is that he's calling us to be out of one, one kingdom into another. Like he's, he's, he, you know, he's stealing citizenship and alliances into another kingdom. That's what makes it political. So if we understand what we're doing when we say, you know, it's becoming to Christ is more than just being saved. It's a part of it. But the power behind it is that we become a citizen of his kingdom. And that's, I think, is, is that needs to be understood. And then the next question is, what is that mission that we're engaged in? Mm -hmm. And I think if we understand that, we'll be much more effective in how we then relate to our governments and our the political bias and the political you know polarization and all that goes along with that he calls us to walk in righteousness he calls us to uh, build his church what's that look like that's people uh, being called and to be a citizen of another kingdom you know we need to evangelize into that kingdom with the intent of of bringing them into the kingdom of god i think the question then comes up is what is the warfare that we need to use? Because the one of the distraction comes down, you hear a, you, you hear a, a political issue that takes place, of a, 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 say something that's extremely unjust in society. What's the warfare that Christ asks us as his king, and we citizens, soldiers of his kingdom, what's the warfare that we need to pick up and answer that call? How do we, how do, how do we relate to it? He, Jesus says, um, my, my kingdom come. You know, he wants heaven to be on earth. And so he's calling us as a king in his kingdom to respond in a very, in a peaceful way, but it's through using his weapons hmm. of warfare, not the weapons of polarization, whether it's the media, mm -hmm. whether it's force, whether it's, you know, a zillion other things that, that's, you know, intimidation, whatever that comes with that. I mean, how did Jesus respond to injustice in his day? All the readings that we have, you know, the, the scriptures that talk about it, he doesn't really comment about, ne the, the, not the specifics at least, he kind of hits the general. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting to me is, so you look at the master and the slave situation in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the scripture. Yeah. He tells the slave to be the best slave that he can be. And he tells the master mm -hmm. to be the kindest master that he can be. Now that to me is, has the potential to be polarized. Right, <laughs> but what he does is he do, yeah. he, he goes he go and and so his his revolution is through a change of heart and a change of uh, of actions for people and so that's the call of citizenship that we can be those people that are 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 you know more than just saved you know Jesus saved me mm -hmm. but that we are called into a king with a kingdom with laws and 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 rules that we're to follow. And so I think, I think it's really important that we understand what are the, what is the weapons of war that we're to use to conquer all the injustice and all the um, terribleness that we do, the evil that we do see, see around us every day. Like it, it, it bombards us every day. Well, so one of the perceptions, I mean, 
I've kind of had this perception a bit as well, is that more Anabaptists, you know, Mennonites, Amish, whoever, um, are getting more involved in American politics. Why is that? And is that a correct perception? And, and what do we do about that? I would have that perception as well. You know, as far as doing the statistics and how it's actually panning out, I don't know the exact numbers to be able to prove that one way or the other. But definitely in conversation, there is this rise in people's opinion of political issues. And the one answer that comes to my mind would be that um, in order for that to take place, I go back to my first statement, I think we would be losing the vision of the mission of the kingdom of God uh. and losing our, the mission of what the warfare of weapons that we're to use in order mm -hmm. to conquer the way Jesus conquered sin and evil and people. And I think it's just the beginning of that is, is eroding away at the clear teachings of what Jesus taught about his kingdom and, and, and his ways. And it's what's interesting is um, John the Baptist, which is the forerunner of Christ, what was his call? Uh, make way for what? The kingdom mm -hmm. of God is at hand. Mm -hmm. And so our mission is always in light of how to present and how to evangelize to the kingdoms of this world, his kingdom. So would you suggest, um, you know, the, the higher levels of political involvement is basically showing that we are starting to lose that, that essence that you're just describing there, you know, of, of continuing on the mission? I personally would, yeah, I mean, um, if we're, you know, we, we, you start down the road of, you know, getting involved of, you know, violent protest and, and voting. What's interesting, I just, um, about two weeks ago, I heard a lady that, you know, She's 60 some years old and you wouldn't recognize her as Anabaptist today, but she would call herself a, a, a Christian and she said well this year she has to vote for the first time. Huh. So what's the reason for that? It's the fear that takes place and grips people's heart that they begin to lose the confidence that Jesus way and Jesus kingdom is actually adequate hmm. to change people's hearts and that we have to resort to the political process and whatever else to, to, to accomplish that or force or whatever means that, that, that tend to play, take place. So then people start voting. And unfortunately, over the years, um, the Anabaptists have voted. Like I'm not a historian that I know mm -hmm. exactly all those dates, but I know it, it definitely goes back to um, the Civil War where you know Anabaptists started to vote. And if you read the history, what's interesting, they started to fear. Like, they didn't want this guy because of this fear, so they vote for this guy, like whatever the situation is. And so I think that's one of the beginnings of the fear. It says, fear the Lord your God, not mm -hmm. fear whatever seems to be urgent at the time mm -hmm. in, in, in our political culture. So that's, that's one, one way that I think um, people find themselves walking away from the true, um, f f from that mission. I, I was thinking a little bit about the first um, your first question, the change of alliances that takes place. And, and, and I was thinking of this. Think of um, David, uh, King David, mm -hmm. when his uh, son saw Absalom uh, tried to, to um, um, take over his kingdom. And what was interesting is David, David fled, okay? And, 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 and how did that take place? Like, you know, and what was interesting is so it says his, his men, when he was out, out, um, out in the woods, they said it was like robbing, uh, the, his, his men was like a she-bear being robbed of her whelps. Now what happened, what, what, what happened there? They were robbed of their alliance. Like, you know, Absalom wanted to steal the hearts of the people, okay? And that's what was taking place. And they were loyal to David. And the beautiful thing is, they were willing to die like a she-bear to save that, that alliance. And we are to have that same kind of passion for the for Christ and his kingdom that we're willing to die you know to be you know aligned with Christ and and with him and the interesting thing about that story is Absalom how did he uh, distract the people he sat at the gate and said where are you from I can help you you don't have someone to hear to, to, to listen to your voice if I was king and so he stole the hearts of the people by promising them another alliance and I, I think that's what happens when we begin to hear the voices of the media and whatever we're listening to, and we get wrapped up in the fear of the moment, if you will, the fear of the situation, and not look back to 
Christ and his um, kingdom and his laws and his weapons of war that we are to use is forgiveness, like um, is changing the, our hearts. And, and I think the greatest thing to change any society is not by the top down through political means, but by the bottom up, which means my heart is changed and my deeds become righteous. And then I influence you and steal your citizenship to the kingdom of God. And you become true to this kingdom. And what's, what's interesting about Christ's kingdom is he calls us to be obedient to these kingdoms unless it's against God. And that's very, very interesting. And the best, my, when, when that drove that point home for me personally is when I realized it's like an embassy in another country. They listen to the laws of, 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 the, of the country that they come from, but they still drive the speed limit, whatever law is put upon them, yeah. they were, are within that framework, but they don't vote there. They don't put the people in government. They don't run for government. They don't do anything of that kingdom that, that bring, that's, that's leadership within that. To me, that was the best example that I've ever heard and has revolutionized my, my life personally. The passion to be willing to change and to be that person first of all and foremost um, in order to then hopefully we can influence others. In your opinion, what should we be doing as we see Anabaptists increasingly taking, I guess we could say, both sides of the political spectrum? My answer to that is I weep. Mm. <laughs> um, I think it's a tragedy that mm. Anabaptists would become so distracted that we would end up taking, taking sides on both sides. Mm. Um, I, I think that's just a terrible place of misunderstanding. And I don't know that I'm going to blame those people that do that, uh, but maybe mm -hmm. blame ourselves. Have we not represented the kingdom of God in a way that they understand that? Just to take sides on both ends of the political, political spe spectrum, I mean, that in itself, to me, jumps ship from one kingdom to the other. It's not that you, uh, it's, it's, yeah. not, it's not that we, I, I think we're very aware of the injustice. Jesus, I think, mm -hmm. was very aware of the injustice of the day. Mm -hmm. um, but he responded to it by being compassionate and by actually calling those individuals to respond right to it. And, mm -hmm. and then he did whatever he could to reach out to that and to alleviate it and to help it. Uh, but he never got involved in the fight between the Samaritans and the Jews. Like, he, 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 he well, that he, would have been the two opposite that sides would have been, right That, there. that would yeah. have been the political um, uh, polar, hmm. polarization of the time that I'm, uh, that I'm aware of. So in my opinion, um, yeah, I guess I would go back that we need to go back and relook at is our mission clear of the kingdom of, of, of Christ? Are we teaching that effectively? And have we um, taught that in a way that people recognize that we, we listen to Jesus and his laws and his kingdom and if we start to you know, sidestep from that thing, it, it, it's so easily to become distracted. Like I, I, mm. think, I think in our day, the socialist issues um, with the, you know, the internet and everything that, that all, it's just so easy to get so much information into our, into our hearts and in, into our minds. So following up on that, you know, we're talking about people taking, you know, the opposite sides on the political spectrum. What is something our churches can do to better, I guess, handle this lightning rod of politics when it comes to interacting in the political sphere? One thing I've always found interesting is when I hear that question, I think, what did Jesus ask us to do when it comes <laughs> to government? And he tells us that we're to pray hmm. for our government leaders. Do we believe that? Do we recognize and understand the power that prayer actually does? And in order for that to be, you know, we say we want change in our, in our, in our society. Jesus says we're to pray for them, that they would allow us to live in peace and harmony, and we're to pray that they would lead, lead well. Do we not believe what Christ says, our King? Like, it, it, it's so easy to um, allow ourselves to be misled and get involved in many other, many other things. What's interesting, I, a while back I, I was doing a sur survey and asking people, so how long do you pray? What is your prayer life? You know, we call ourselves yeah. Kingdom Christians or Anabaptists, and you know, we depend on this King Jesus are we praying to him like, like he calls us to? Are we praying to him for our brothers and sisters? Are we praying to him for to help us to be better people? I heard the, one of the most powerful stories I've ever heard of prayer. 
and it was this man, he, he was actually, I think he was in, uh, from, from India, I think it was. He was a, a not a nice man. He was married and had not nice to his wife, not nice to his children. Um, he, was, he was mean, he was demanding. In fact, I think he, was, uh, uh, he drank a lot. And he, you know, he would come home night after night and an abuser and was really, really violent. But his wife was a Christian. And uh, she would always, you know, talk to him about being a Christian. He wasn't interested. And, but she would always go into her back room and pray. And this was always irritating when, he, she, he was, she, when she was back there praying. And one night he snuck in and was listening to her pray. And you know what she was praying about? She was praying that she could be a better mother and a better wife to her husband and that the Lord would help her be that person. And it broke him down. Most people, when they pray, there's this temptation to, you know, I pray for you, that you would be a better person. Yeah. So the power is, is that if we are them people, that gives us, if, if we are walking in righteousness, I mean, look at the, look at the life of Christ and his apostles. They, 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 they lived that life out. And they were one of the, some of the most effective people of all time. And I'm going to suggest it goes back to their prayer life. The prayer life gives opportunity to change people in a way that I think we completely underestimate and miscalculate. And, and I think it's a misunderstanding of what, what, what our prayer life should be about. So I really don't know what you, how you pray, mm -hmm. but my life will reveal it. If I start to become distracted, I think that's evidence of me not having a full prayer life and not being that person of, ch of, of uh, that agent of change. Because I've often wondered like <laughs> the amount of energy that's expended on not doing that. You know, what would happen if we would turn those energies to, to that prayer mm -hmm. life? Like how can we serve as a church and be better mm -hmm. and, and be Jesus, you know, to our society? And I go back to the weapons of, uh, of, of Jesus' kingdom, you know, and that's mm -hmm. one of his weapons that he was that he asked us to be to, to do yeah. and participate in. Um, he asked the one of the other weapon is as I think is foundational is forgiveness. Um, I think that is just something that we talk about, and I think the Anabaptists have done a very good job. And I think one of a, a, a current event is uh, what is the, called the Nickel Mine shooting that had took mm -hmm. place in the Lancaster community. Mm -hmm. um, that forgiveness that comes out of lives that that recognize that that is massive. Like it, it, you know, so, and that's that's. Um, peacefulness, the, you know, living peacefully, um, that's the weapons of warfare. That I think if I can learn to be that kind of person and that powerful and learn to be kind and represent the kingdom in that way, that's the most powerful agent of change that we have for a politicized, polarized culture, um, that everyone's always up in the air about things. You know, for those, of th those watching, what are the ways we can develop more Christ-like attitudes when it comes to <laughs> seeing what the government's doing, politics, the media, regardless of our own personal opinions. How could, yeah, like what can we do? W what can we do? Um, I would suggest actually one thing that really comes to my mind is how critical I hear people getting about our governments. Mm -hmm. um, it seems I don't care what side you're on, uh, they polarize in a way that the other side becomes bad and evil and really terrible, terrible, terrible people. And I think as Christians, we should not engage in that kind of negativity. Um, I think it, it, it creates disrespect in our own hearts towards our government leaders. And how are we to forgive our enemies if we're going to have those kind of feelings and, and, and attitudes towards government? What happens next? Um, you know, do we fight against that? And so that, that's just one thing that comes to mind. And if you feed yourself full of media, it's going to be really hard to have good feelings towards them, good attitudes. You know, I, I do not believe that we're a kingdom that is called into the cornfield. Like, you know, we kind of disappear into, you know, and, and we build walls and be, it become safe zones. I think the kingdom of God is designed by design, is that we are advancing into those, in, into all the kingdoms around us to take over them, kingdoms, and to bring people into his kingdom. So I think it's, it's exactly the opposite of what people often think about. Mm. And so we need to be praying and evangelizing and discipling people, building these beautiful um, churches of, of, of peace. Um, and, and that's the unfortunate part. Yeah. Sometimes people don't experience that in, in churches. They, they see so much division and so much frustration and divides, unfortunately. 
And if anything, we need to start with ourselves. That's what Jesus calls us to do, that we become that angel that is peaceful and gentle and kind mm -hmm. and convinced of, of, of what we're doing. I, I think that represents mm -hmm. the life of Christ. And, and I, I really believe that we need to start with ourselves. Well, yeah, because that kind of goes into the, the last, you know, the concluding piece I had, the last question is like, what are maybe some ways we've fallen short? And then practically speaking, what are some things people watching can do right now? You know, how can we take all these things you've talked about, wrap them up and, and say, okay, here's some things we can start implementing. Well, as I said before, um, I, I do think we need to start with ourselves and maybe with our families, with our churches, and just really, um, I would suggest starting with discipleship in our, in, in our own churches. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's something that we assume going to church and um, that that's gonna take care of it, or we assume, you know, the family is gonna take care of that. Mm -hmm. But when you look at people that succeed in, in, in history, the apostles, they all had someone that they kind of took under their wing. And, you know, John was a disciple, Polycarp was a disciple of, of the Apostle John. And you can look at it and almost all the apostles. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very valuable thing that w it might be something we ought to look into and be more intentional about. Mm -hmm. um, we started that, you know, in, in our church several years back of, of having a disciple ship of, uh, with the men and mm -hmm. um, just you know bring have accountability helping us work out if there's issues in our lives that we don't see mm. um, just to speak into the light in a very gentle way and it's been a very powerful thing I think if we want to change the world let's start with ourselves and our churches and just dial that in and I don't mean I don't mean in a tunnel vision but sure. but but we, we start to change ourselves and and if you're that genuine individual you're going to go out and share the gospel. Um, you're going you're gonna to want others to experience that. Be that agent of change and disciple one another to that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I personally think we make more headway of discipling. If I disciple three people and then those three people go, three people go out and disciple another three people, mm -hmm. we're going to make more progress of change in a, than, than, than preaching to the masses, masses mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. um, because when it's personally connected, that thing just goes step by step. I mean, I've learned to know David Berceau, for example, and I have been discipled by him uh, for several years. He's older than I am. You know, I know John Martin, Lynn Martin, all these guys that, that I know, and I'm a student of them, and I, I benefit from them. I think I want everyone to experience that, uh, to be discipled, and then I feel motivated to be that person and go out and disciple others. And look at the string that's taken place. like. David's influence is massive um, because of that. Thanks so much for taking the time to share. Thank I you. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it, Brian. Yeah.